Today we continue in our survey of the Old Testament and today we're looking at the tabernacle and we want to begin to look at that but before we do we want to go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father give us wisdom and understanding in all our study of the Word of God how we need it. Lord, may we be guided and directed into your truth. May we not limit you, but may we not step out beyond what your word has said in any direction to our own ideas and our own thinking. And so, Father, we pray for the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the organization of our thoughts upon this material today, we pray. Lord, help us and guide us and may as we view these things and think about these things may they cause us to rejoice and to think about you <clears throat> and Lord we know that you're the God of heaven and earth may you be the God that sits on the throne of our life we pray in Jesus name we ask these things. Amen. Our God is so very great. His wisdom is all knowingness and so God in His creation and God in His word and God in His planning has put so much there that sometimes we miss much of it, I know. And perhaps in all eternity, things that we do not know and could not possibly know now, not the things of premier importance in the Word of God, they are clearly seen, but even details about them that is not apparent, that is not the primary uh, emphasis of the Word of God or the primary purpose for us to know them, we will be able to take the Scriptures and see things, pictures and examples and workings and plannings and why God did this and why He did that and in our lives too. That God's marking out of things for us that every little detail always conforms to His purpose and His plan. God is so great and so smart and so wise that there is no limitation to His wisdom or His power. I remember that when we studied the Old Testament and studied the tabernacle in college, in the Bible college that I went to, <clears throat> I think it was then and not later, but there was this uh, minister that had a working tabern, a model of the tabernacle, a uh, a, a model that scholars had, uh, on the information of scholars and teachings and the number of the posts and the gates and the layout of the uh, uh, furniture in the tabernacle and the materials that the tabernacle was made, he had a working model of it so that he could set the thing up and you could visibly see the idea of scholars as to how the tabernacle looked. And he would teach for several months a uh, course upon the tabernacle and, and its meaning. And it was very impressive, I know. And it was amazing to hear and see the information that, that had been built into that model and built into the study of the thing. And so as I rethought about and restudied the tabernacle and went back and, and did some research upon it, I did... So not really knowing how I was going to handle all that great information. And there is a tremendous amount of information in the, uh, in the study of the tabernacle that I suppose is possible. One thing that I found, though, that I had not realized before, and maybe this is the kind of thing that... Uh, that time and thought and maturity may produce, I found as I went back and read 
that scholars are not absolutely sure, some of them, about the arrangement of the furniture. That we aren't told exactly how we have arranged it, perhaps on the basis of how we think it is based on the scripture I know. And, and, uh, but the arrangement of the tabernacle may not be certain because there's one famous leading scholar that takes a verse of scripture where it talks about the brazen altar being by the gate. And so he puts the, the first two uh, <clears throat> objects of furniture outside the, the post of the tabernacle and not inside as, as most scholars have and suppose. And of course, when I read things like that scholars write, and most of the furniture in the tabernacle was made of what is called a kale wood, or sometimes translated shittim wood, but this wood was a durable, practical, lasting wood that was present in the land of Palestine that had a lasting quality to it, and scholars have attributed that to the humanity of Christ. Now, how they know that that piece of wood and its characteristics refers to a, the humanity of Christ, I do not know for sure. And I just take their word for things like that. But I'm sure if I studied the wood and its characteristics that I might get some ideas why they would say that. But here again we get into the area of the difference between type and picture. Now, type is num something, a meaning that I know for certain, and I do know for certain because of Hebrews, that the tabernacle and its furniture and its layout was made according to the pattern that God showed Moses and is in heaven. And, of course, we're told this again in Hebrews, that the real abode of God and the real tabernacle and it's laid out in a similar way, uh, that in fact, probably the same way, was is in heaven in the in the throne room presence of God, and the veil, of course, there, uh, that was red, and all of this. Uh, uh, of course, we know that the veil uh, represented the flesh of Christ, and when He died on the cross, that that veil was rent in two, and by His death, by the death of His His uh, physical life on the cross, that that way was opened into the holiest place of salvation for every person. There are many things like that that we do know. And it is very possible as this teacher that had the model indicated that everything meant something. At least everything is, a, is an illustration of a possibility of something. But sometimes as an allegory and as assuming meanings, scholars might be wrong in that we just take you know, an idea, like for instance, the colors of the materials of the tabernacle. Now, there was the color of white, which we know that refers to purity. And there was the color blue, which we know that generally is attributed to heavenly things. There is the color of scarlet, which we, of course, attribute to uh, redemption. And uh, there was the uh, gold in the uh, tabernacle that we attribute to <coughs> value and preciousness and deity. Uh, but sometimes I think we stretch these ideas perhaps beyond types to just mere illustration and pictures. And as we've said, you can find a picture of the gospel everywhere if you want to. You can make the telephone pole across and the lines that go through it carry the gospel just as we're supposed to carry the gospel in all the world. The lines carry the, uh, the gospel and what we need is power in our Christian life and that's what the lines of the electric from the, from, the, uh, from the poles supply. They supply power and so from the power of the cross and Jesus we get and you see where I'm going with this as long as you deal in allegory and symbols you can build a system and, and, and there's a meaning everywhere in anything. And you can make everything mean something if you just apply logic and the basic truth that you start with. So I'm, I'm anxious to get to heaven and, and, and let God tell me what all these things mean because some of the scholars that I read after, they may be wrong. Some of the scholars said they, there's no way of knowing how many posts there are in the, in, in the tabernacle walls that made up the well. 
and there's no way of knowing exactly how the furniture was arranged in the tabernacle. Though I'm going to tell you what a, a, a marvelous preacher came and preached in our chapel service about the tabernacle. And it was a thrilling thought, just as I have thrilling thoughts, and, and some of them are based on what other scholars have said. We do not know, but we do know that the tabernacle is a type and a picture. It is made after the pattern of what is in heaven. And so today we're going to say know the meaning of the tabernacle. Now we're going to try to deal with things that we do know are there and possibilities of their importance and significance. And even in that, you know, even in that, I'm taking what other scholars say a lot of the times. Of course, they make sense and they can base it up on, on current usages. And we haven't de dealt with numerology in the Bible, and I think that numerology can be a tool, like the number seven is oftentimes represented, the complete set of something. The number ten sometimes has significance in, in periods of time and in testing. Uh, the uh, number 40, 40 days, has significance in certain areas, and there is the numerology of the scripture, and all that involves in the, the number of posts in the tabernacle and the place it was set up in the camp. I am saying this, our God is so great that there may be pictures in everything he's ever done in any event in scripture. But the important emphasis of the word of God, I think, are there in the literal surface meaning so that we do not have to build our faith on whether the number of fence posts in the wall was 100 or 50 or 60 or 35. Everything doesn't have to be exact. And in a parable, and in, a, uh, uh, in the parables that Jesus told, it teaches one main truth. Every event in the parable doesn't have to dovetail together, though many of them do. And so in our study of the tabernacle, we're going to try to deal with the main parts. And, and I don't remember all the things that the guy said about the model of the tabernacle. But it would not be an unprofitable study to look at those. But we need to always keep in mind that allegory and the pictures that we can see that are possible are not as important as the truth that we can see verifiable in the Word of God. And so today we say, know the meaning of the tabernacle. How can you do that? Well... We can see what it represents, and we must do that. We can see what it represents, and in seeing what God said his tabernacle represented, we can get the main importance of what it means, and what he's trying to teach us, and what he was trying to teach Israel through the giving them of the tabernacle. Moses was told very specifically to make everything in the tabernacle after the pattern that he saw in heaven. Now, I do not know what ev that everything was, and that, of course, is an implication that even the, the length of the, <clears throat> the uh, cloth, the, uh, the color of the cloth, and as I said, scholars disagree upon what some of these animal skins, which animal it was, and... And there's one of them that seems to be untranslatable in the Hebrew. They don't know for sure which animal it's referring to. And, and possibly, uh, like in the goats, the goat, we know that one of the layers of the animal skins anyway was goat hair, and it was black. And of course, black usually refers to sin, and the black, if it was black, was between the red and the white. Of course, we could, uh, it looks like that it would be black red and then white, and maybe that was the way it was laid in there. Black our sins, red, uh, redeemed by the, by the uh, salvation of God and the cross of Christ, and then white, having been changed and made pure in his sight. But you see, you see the complexity in this. But this we do know for sure, that Moses was told to build the tabernacle according to the pattern that he had seen that was in heaven. And we know from Hebrews that there is 
a heavenly situation where God represents these truths and has these objects of furniture in heaven representing what was physically put in the tabernacle on earth. We know that from Hebrews for sure. These are not imaginary things, but God has these same lampstands and the same shoe bread table and the same uh, altars, the altar of incense and the brazen altar and the laver. These things are in heaven. And so Moses was told, make sure you build everything the way that I tell you to, every part of it. Make sure that the mixture of used in the frankincense and the incense and the oil of anointing, make sure it is ever duplicated and produced for any other use but beside the worship that I have in the tabernacle. And so it may be, be when we get to heaven we'll understand that every single thing in the tabernacle meant something. But until God tells us what it meant, then what we think it may mean may be right and it may not. And the pictures that we imagine may be accurate and they may not and we need to understand that. And of course the main feature of the tabernacle was that all of it together and especially the ark which was in the holy of holy place, the main feature of the tabernacle was that it represented the presence of God. It represent the presence of God. God was among His people. God was there. He was seen as, as localized. And, and we have what is called the Shekinah glory, which people believe that there was a glory. And remember when the tabernacle was built and dedicated, Moses could not remain there because of the glory. And he had been in the very presence of God. The glory that filled the tabernacle, God miraculously filled it, just as he miraculously perhaps sent the fire down to the brazen labor and it for the sacrifices were all the brazen altar where the sacrifices were made and it was never to go out. It was kept burning perpetually. And God's Shekinah glory, the glory that was in the pillar in the cloud, rested perhaps, came uh, and rested on the tabernacle and his presence was manifested in his people. And the lesson, of course, was that God Himself is here with you, with Israel, as you journey, as you live. And the lesson to us is that Jesus spiritually lives within our heart. The Holy Spirit lives within our heart. The presence of God the Father is in our heart. And, and though He is great and marvelous and the God of the universe, and we have never physically seen Him, His spiritual presence is with us. And if we're going to know the meaning of the tabernacle, we need to look at its furnishings. Now, what was in there? There was the brazen altar. And, of course, we do know through the study of symbols and meanings that this word bronze and brass all, uh, usually refers to judgment almost always. And, and this altar where the sacrifices were offered and the fire was perpetually kept, and the sacrifices were burnt that God wanted burnt. This was an indication of the holiness and the judgment of God. There was a laver. We don't know how large it was there in which uh, brass laver in which water was put, which the priest used for washing and cleansing. And they must ceremonially represent the washings. And, of course, this may be, and I think is it, the idea of what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You, uh, that, uh, uh, <clears throat> that you must be uh, born of water and of the Holy Spirit. That is, there must be that uh, regeneration as Paul talks about in, in Titus by the washing of the Holy Spirit. Being regenerated as the priest cleansed with salvation as the priest washed their hands represented to, of the salvation that's in, in Christ. And uh, I think we see that in the laver. And the laver was there. And, and then the altar of golden incense was there. And perhaps this uh, uh, represents prayer. And of course incense does represent prayer and worship in and, and the Word of God. And this, this golden altar was there. Uh, with the idea that I, 
it was worship to the God of heaven and earth. And, of course, the lampstand there, the sevenfold lampstand that we see in Revelation, reminds us of the light of the world, Jesus, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit who gives light and illumination to God's Word and, and everything that God does. And then finally, in the very holiest of holies, was the Ark of the Covenant. And here was the Ark, and over it the cherubim. And they were to sprinkle the blood on the top of the ark, the mercy seat. And God was uh, reminded of the death of his final lamb, his son on the cross. And, and sin was appeased and covered until Christ could come and die for him. And, and so these are the things that we have. And we also have some other things. We have the high priestly garments and the garments that the priest wore with the Especially the high priest had the uh, breastplate on it with the twelve stones of the tribes of Israel, and then these other two stones, Urim and Thummim. Before the, they had the, even the Old Testament scriptures that these were used by God to answer questions, perhaps or give guidance. Lit up, we think, according to God's wishes in some a way that man could understand what God was trying to tell them, and and. We see this high priest garment again in Revelation 1 in Jesus, the eternal uh, son of righteousness. The ancient of days is dressed in the garments of the high priest. And, and that was part of the tabernacle worship. And then we see, uh, we see that many other things were too. But the furniture that we have mentioned in the tabernacle, these are the basic important things and other things like fence posts and even the direction that they put pointed the Ark of the Covenant in in relationship to the camp of Israel all of these things probably meant something or at least we can find pictures of what they could have possibly meant but we do not know for sure unless God tells us of that well we say know the meaning of the tabernacle we see what it represented and it represented the presence of God we see its furnishings, and we have looked at the major articles of furniture in the tabernacle, and now we see the arrangement of the furnishings. And I remember this powerful, well-known preacher coming to chapel, and he preached on the tabernacle, and he said that these articles were arranged in the form of a cross. Now, the, some of the scholars that I read said that, well, we don't know exactly for sure. We think we know, but we may not know how they were all arranged. And I looked at a drawing that, that an artist had made on the basis of what scholarship has thought, and sure enough, in a big rectangle square, which was represented the foot, the uh, post of the tabernacle, the outer court, and of course within that outer court was a tent, but starting in that outer court of the tabernacle where, you know, it was, no, it was not restricted so much. And the, the, the deeper you go into the tabernacle, of course, the more restricted there were, the more rules there were. And so that only the high priest went once a year into the holies of holies to, to sprinkle the, the blood on the mercy seat. And they put a rope on his leg so that if he had sinned, or if he did something that he knew he shouldn't do while he was in there and God killed him, that they could pull him out without going in after him. And so they uh, put harnesses on him so that they could pull him out if they needed to. And not everybody was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, just as God had prescribed that they could go and do and minister. But in this outer court, there was, first of all, we believe, and most scholars put it just inside the gate, there was this huge brazen altar upon which the sacrifices were offered. Right in front of that, in a direct line, was this waver of brass that was filled with water for the washing and cleansing of the priests before they ministered. And then, straight in line with that, was the Holy of Holies, the entrance, I mean not the Holy of Holies, the holy place that the, that the priests could go in. And at the back of the Holy of the Holies, next to the Holy 
at the back of the holy place, next to the Holy of Holies, was right in line with the laver and the uh, brazen altar, was the golden altar of incense. To each side, there was a candlestick on one side and the table of shoe bread on the other. And so these articles, as you look at them, the, the lampstand and the table of shoe bread, which, of course, Jesus is the bread of life. And much of the tabernacle, we believe, does refer to the persons and work of the Trinity. And Jesus' redemption, the cross, is at the heart of everything that is done. And then back up straight behind the, uh, the golden incense in the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. So that these things line up as a cross, this man said. And so as you go in, you see that God's plan is about a cross. Now theologically we know that is true, that God's redemption has to do with the cross. And this is God's idea as to the fact that God laid the tabernacle exactly like, out like that so it would line up the furniture of it in the symbol of a cross. I do not know. It is like our God to do that. But we are not told that that is the way it is for sure. And perhaps he is right. And perhaps that's the way it is. But certain things we can know for sure. We can know that the primary meaning of the tabernacle and its primary function was that the presence of God was with his people manifest. And we can know its furnishings, what they were and some of what they mean. And we can know that there was an outer court that was less restrictive and then the inner holy place where only the priest went and then the holiest of all where the presence of God was it represented and manifest. If you have time, do an intensive study on the tabernacle and, and learn the opinions of scholars and men what some of these things may picture. It is an amazing thing. But do not forget about what God has clearly said that the important things mean today, I pray. Amen.